welcome everyone to the second part of the lecture series titled Sri Aurobindo's Political and Cultural Philosophy, Nationalism and Swaraj. This lecture series has been organized by Center for Human Sciences, Rishiwet University and has been sponsored by the Indian Council of Philosophical Research. The title of today's lecture is Sri Aurobindo's Thoughts on Education as Foundation for Indian Nationalism. In today's lecture, we will focus on the dimensions of education as laid out by Sri Aurobindo and how it can lead to the building of a strong nation. And for this, we have with us Dr. Priya M. Vaidyaji. She is a professor at the Department of Philosophy, University of Mumbai, and a member of Rishihud University's Academic Council. But above all, she is a remarkable scholar and a researcher, and a researcher of the highest order. She is the author of two books, including Praxis of Education, Swami Vivekananda. She has also received many awards, including the Arsh Vidya Bharti Award for her outstanding contribution to the domain of research. And now I would like to invite Dr. Sampadanand Mishraji, uh, Director, Center for Human Sciences, to give the welcome address. Welcome, sir. Namaskar to all of you. Uh, Center for Human Sciences has been organizing this series of lectures on Sri Aurobindo. And uh, this year uh, being the 150th birth anniversary of Sri Aurobindo and 75 years of uh, India's independence. So the government of India has assigned a lot of uh, uh, programs to us. So then. <coughs> we can conduct seminars, workshops, and lecture series on different aspects of Sri Aurobindo. And this special lecture program, series program, is only on Sri Aurobindo's idea of nationalism. So uh, Sri Aurobindo, he wrote at, at one place that spirituality and Sanatana Dharma is the only nationalism of India. And that spirituality, that Sanatana Dharma, <coughs> can be best taught through the education system. While drafting the national education uh, policy or national education system, no one had asked Sri Aurobindo to do that, but as a part of his contribution to the nation. So he uh, chopped out the five different levels of education, the physical education, the vital education, the mental education, psychic education, and spiritual education, but beyond that, there is also supramental education, which not he himself has not spoken much about it. But from the principles of his yoga, supramental yoga, because ultimately, beyond the spiritual education, it has to be the supramental education. So about which more exploration is needed. And that is how we can create by following this, the principles, the philosophy of education that Sri Aurobindo has laid down for India, that we can create a true national education system by which we become aware of the very spirit of our nation. That sense of nationhood, the sense of nationalism, it grows organically through the education. So uh, I welcome you all and I welcome you, uh, Priyaji, for this. Uh, lecture today and uh, I, I expect that I, I, and also like I request all of you to listen to it carefully participate ask questions and uh, share your thoughts also on the topic as you listen to her you will get certain clarity if you have something to share you can share and feel free to ask questions thank you all Thank you very much, sir. And now I would like to invite our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Shobhit Mathurji, to give, uh, address us on this occasion. Welcome, sir. So I don't want to take a lot of your time. Um, but when we say Rishihood, and some of you are our new learners who have come in, um, naturally the question comes, who are these Rishis? What is this Rishihood? Um, what do we take inspiration from? What are you expecting here that um, from us do you all, uh, do we expect you to become rishis in that sense? 
So we don't have to think about that as much, but in the modern times, if you look and you go back, uh, possibly in the last 100 years, two names definitely stand out. One is Swami Vivekananda, the other is Sri Aurobindo, who have been rishis in that sense that we can all look up to. And very interestingly, Dr. Vedya's PhD thesis is exactly on this. How do you, I mean, the education philosophy from the teachings of uh, <coughs> Swami Vivekananda and Sri Aurobindo. So we couldn't be able to have a better speaker speak on education at Rishihood, someone who has delved her entire life into how do we bring their teachings into an educational system. So I'm very happy that she's here and she's also part of our academic council. For some of you here who are new to society of an academic council, an academic council is kind of the overall academic guiding body about how do we design the curriculum here, how do we design our programs. So we need a very established scholars who can guide us uh, in developing a very good academic program here. And she's been gracious to be a part of it and support us. So we'll keep continuing to get her guidance, but this is a very good opportunity to first hear from her about uh, what their ideas were and how we can bring it into our lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing with us your thoughts. And now, moving forward, I would like to invite our guest speaker for today, Dr. Priyam Vadeji, to take today's lecture. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Asatoma Sad Gamaya, Tamasoma Jodir Gamaya, Prutir Mamrutam Gamaya, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. My gratitude to Rishihood family, to the Vice Chancellor, to Professor Mishra, and all the faculty members, and my dear brothers, sisters who have made this possible today. Today I have, although a special lecture, but I will not be in the teaching mode because I am also very eager to develop a dialogue, learn something from each one of you before I leave this room. So I have made a PowerPoint presentation and there are approximately 14 slides and I have tried my best to make it more impressive. But let me start my session with a small story, which perhaps is symbolic of what I'm going to say. The story is uh, by Mulk Rajananji, and I'm not narrating the entire story, but the gist of it, which interests me and the connect which I've tried to develop. So like all stories, this story also starts with Once Upon a Time. And once upon a time, a child uh, was uh, taken to a fair, village fair. And in India, when we talk about a village fair, I'm sure most of you have that kind of a vivid memory of it. So when the child is taken to that fair, you can imagine the state of mind of that child. So when first he's taken to a jalebi stall, he tells to mother, I want this jalebi. So mother says, we will have it because there are many stalls. We will come back. And she just takes him ahead. There's a kite stall. It says, I want a kite. She says, yes, yes, I will give you the kite. Further next, there is a toy. He's fascinated about and he says, I want it. The next stall is of ribbons and he wants the colorful ribbon. He says, I want that. And when he's saying that, this time he doesn't listen to a no from his mother. And so he's smiling and he thinks, oh, mother is going to buy this. And when he turns, he's not able to see his mother. In this village fair, the mother is lost. And so he's in tears. And a gentleman 
observes this boy, lifts him up, says, don't cry, and he takes him to that stall. Do you want the jalebi? No. Do you want the kite? No. Do you want the ribbons? No. I want my mother. When we look at the story of the lost child, and when we look at education and our connection to India, sometimes I feel we are the lost child. Where the attractions we have and the way we want to explore our life is so much that we start going away from our mother, that is our country. And then when we get or we are trying to do all this, and then we understand that more than that is the most important which I have totally forgotten. And when I look at Sri Aurobindo's thoughts on education, I think as a student, as a teacher, I have benefited and continue to benefit with the perspective. And today's presentation is on Sri Aurobindo's thoughts on education as foundation for Indian nationalism. So in what context are we going to discuss and how is it going to be? So the objectives of the lecture are to briefly review education in India. Like we are aware about it, so we will review it. My review will be something like you also may have thought about it. Second important thing which I have tried to do, to review India in education today. Where is that India? Is it there or is it absent or what is it? So we will try to review it together. The third is focus on Sri Aurobindo's thoughts of education where we are trying to say as a foundation for Indian nationalism. And the last is Sri Aurobindo's uh, thoughts on education, the global relevance. Uh, in a lecture, we teachers use concepts and these concepts will come again and again in context to the topic. And so, in this context, uh, there are, as I have located, that these concepts will keep coming in my lecture too. And so we're going to take this with us as a toolkit that there is going to be a word like philosophy. I'm, I, I know you all know it, but I'm just trying to tell myself what philosophy is all about. So philosophy comes from the root word philosophia, which means love for wisdom, love for knowledge. Then we talk about Indian philosophy, a context will come and we'll discuss about the Indian philosophical perspective. So here we're going to discuss, uh, when we talk about Indian philosophy, we'll try to focus on the spiritual dimension. It is reflected as Darshan Shastra. It is more intricate, it focuses on the ultimate reality. We also will look at the dimension of education and what it means, what are its deeper reflections. We also have used the word thoughts. When we talk about thoughts, we are also interested in the perspective of that person. So what is that perspective? We are going to discuss here Sri Aurobindo's perspective. When we talk about the word foundation, it's a very strong word which means the base. When we talk about nationalism, it's a very interesting uh, word when I looked into the different dictionaries. The Oxford says the set of beliefs, symbols, which identifies a group. And there is also, it's a sentiment on common grounds where people come together when we talk about Indianness. When we talk about Indian nationalism, we're talking about that India, just not in the symbol and the uh, dimension which we are just trying to look at it from a tangible dimension but even in the spirit that is India. When we talk about the word global, in fact India uh, used this word global centuries back when we used the word Vasudeva Kutumbaka. So we are not quite new to the term globalization, it already was there. However, we did not coin it as globalization, but Vasudeva Kutumbuk, the entire world is my family. So the concern is not just India, but the world. When we look at the word holistic, which I'm likely to use in my lecture, when I use the word holistic, which means physical, mental, emotional, 
social and spiritual development. So it is development from all the dimensions. When I use the word transformation, I'm also going to use the word information. Most of you, we are aware what information is. So information is that which we capture, that which we call data. When we talk about transformation, I cannot pinpoint and say, yeah, this is what transformation is. It's a very subtle process. So we're going to talk about this trans transformation at the level of the self and at the level of the society. And uh, we are also going to use, uh, perhaps you will get more familiar with the word manifestation. So what is this manifestation? It is a progress from that which is implicit to that which will become explicit. And then perhaps there are many other words which I am going to use. But these are the key concepts which perhaps will come in my lecture. When we move to the next slide, the design of the lecture. So the first part of my lecture will reflect upon the context of the lecture. Why this lecture? Why, uh, uh, what, what's the need for this lecture? Second is, we're going to look at Education in India, as I said, a brief review. And then India and Education, then and now, I will be referring to NEP 2020. And then Sri Aurobindo's thoughts on education and how are they the foundation of Indian nationalism and global relevance. I also want to say you can critically look at it, you can ask me very pointed questions and there is a possibility that I may not have answers to all your questions. But being a philosopher, even asking good questions is an art. So when you are trying to focus on the topic, we are all going to learn together because when we are going to look at India, we all have our journeys. We all have some kind of an experience. We have a context. So we are going to travel together. The context of the lecture. Why this lecture? And I'm, I'm grateful to Dr. Mishra who invited me. And this is Sri Aurobindo's 150th birth anniversary. So whenever we talk about a great yogi, a philosopher, there is the three dimension I look at this particular context of the lecture, remembrance. When we look at Sri Aurobindo's life and work, there's an awe feeling. There's a feeling that how did he explore these dimensions? So there is a spiritual legacy. We have a spiritual legacy which we talk, that is what India is. And so this spiritual legacy involves his sadhana, his, his concern for India and the world. And in that, there is also the foresight. It is not just contemplation, but what should be the change. So when we remember this, it is not just knowing about it. When we start knowing about it, we also start doing about it. And that's why the million dollar question is, after so many years, what have we really taken and how have we integrated and what have been the change? And so we see that probably uh, we do not see the manifestation taking place for whatever reasons, as we say that we will look at it later. When we look at the reflections, Sri Aurobindo tried to focus on the matter, spiritualized matter. So focusing on the outer development and inner development, which is very important. So the matter, spirit, connect, when we try to reflect on the world which is today, outside and the world within, is there a harmony and should we really consider this harmony very important? So this is the reflection and in different processes and systems we are going to see this. And the relevance of it as we know that this is something, it's value rich person. So are we values rich? I'm reminded of Swami Vivekananda's thought when he stated that if you really want to see, know a person, he states, work with that person. 
the minute you start working with that person, you know what kind of a person is that person. When we talk about values, values rich person. He also states that when you are alone and how you behave with your own self, that also determines that values. So when you look at Sri Aurobindo's thoughts, when you start reading them, they give you that perspective of developing a values rich life. Because there is a conversation which is built up, there is a dialogue with the self becomes more meaningful and when we talk about values, this dialogue provides that direction. There are no dilemmas there, there is a dialogue. So in that context, nation and the world becomes important because I am not living in isolation, I am a part of this nation and when we talk about India, we talk about our connect to Vasudeva Kutumbakam also. So in that sense, uh, my dear students, uh, we are very fortunate to be in a country like India. But that is not enough. We have to read more about great people like Sri Aurobindo and try to see in what way can we pay our homage by Developing a better India and a better world because this is the need of the world. And the hope is from the younger generation because you can make that change. When we look at education in India, a brief review, we had the history of ancient India. When we look at the Gurukula system, we already had life skills in our Gurukula system. It is again a coined uh, concept today. So when we look at the values rich and experiential education, uh, when you read uh, books on Gurukula system, it is so fascinating the training which was given by the Guru. When you look during the British rule, the education was more information oriented. It became more mechanized and there was increase in mental slavery. There was fear and doubt because there was imposition of Western approach and contempt for India. So there was some kind of uh, education which was imposed. We were going away, as I said in that story, we were going away from our own mother and we were supposed to be happy and some people decided to be happy that way but that damaged the progress of the country and it also damaged the development of the person and so then after independence what happened did we change unfortunately no we took many, many, many years even to understand that we were having this mental slavery. We also were not able to think. And here when I look at the philosophical realm of deconstruction and reconstruction was essential. So we had to deconstruct it and the need was to reconstruct it. And this reconstruction, when we look at what was to be deconstructed, that only one language is important. The vernacular languages, as you know, took a back seat. People who didn't know English, even today, they have a lot of complexes. They feel, oh, I can't do it. And so there is something as a problem. Communication is affected. I'm not trying to say English is not important. I'm trying to say English is not the only important language. So when we look at the beauty of Indian languages, we have seen that that was broken. And as you are very much aware about my colleagues, this and the attack on the backbone of India, the culture of India. And uh, we also see the attitude uh, when we are trying to say about alienation. When we talk about uh, what we today call freedom, that I want alienate. I, I want to have my own space. We are going away from our family system. We do not like to share. 
And when we look at India, where we talk about the dimension of sharing, being together, there is something missing. And I wouldn't blame the West for this. I will blame ourselves. Because it is up to us that in what way can we reconstruct that gap. And that is why when we look at NEP 2020, I'm sure most of you who are here have read it. And if you have not read it, please read it. Because we are in India, which is evolving. And just to make things very interesting and clear, when you look at NEP 2020, you see India in education. You see that kind of a transition and transformation in the curriculum at different levels. And when we talk about experiential learning, we talk about values, we talk about life skills, we talk about India, the greatness of India, and developing the skills, developing and understanding who we are and what we can become. So there is a kind of a spiritual revolution. Now, we are also afraid to use the word spiritual. Because what is spiritual, as uh, sir also mentioned, that you may have a question, what is the meaning of being a Rishi? So is it isolation, alienation, or a dimension of that wisdom which shows me that path? And that path which wisdom tries to show me where there are no dilemmas, where my discriminatory ability becomes more richer. And when that becomes richer, when I understand what is right and what is wrong, this is what our education now is trying to give us. I've just mentioned one dimension, but there are several such aspects which will unfold and that's why. That India, which perhaps we left years back, is now slowly getting into the process of education. When we look at Sri Aurobindo's thoughts on education as foundation for Indian nationalism, when you look at the preface on national education, there is a focus on unfolding. The teacher's role is not of imposing. The mobile also imposes something on us. When a lecture is going on, we still get distracted. We still want to see because we have become the machines have made us slaves. That mental slavery of whatever that can be. When we talk about the teacher as a facilitator. Teacher is not just going to come and impose and just go away. But teacher knows that you already know it in some context and just trying to facilitate it. So there is a very subtle process where you give the other the space, where you try to respect the learner and you help the learner to enjoy the process of what is called education. Now this, how is this connected to the Indian dimension? How is it uh, the dimension of nationalism or the foundation? Because when we look at this dimension of Sri Aurobindo, the psycho-spiritual dimension, the focus, when you look at the Upanishads, when you look at the Puranas, when you look at the Indian philosophical approach, when you look at Vivekananda, Sri Aurobindo and so many others, they talk about this dimension of the within. And there is nothing magical about it. It is an exploration which the more we do the within, it contributes to our creativity, it contributes to our innovation, it enriches our learning and for that, that looking within is essential. This however does not mean that we are isolated from the world. And that's why matter spirit dimension becomes interesting. And thus we are trying to say, as Sri Aurobindo says, we have to prevent the degrading of the national mind soul and character. The minute I start degrading that, when 
I try to exploit my mind. The mind is like a monkey. And when you look at the philosophy of yoga, there are, when you look at the yoga sutras, when you look at Swami Vivekananda's four yoga, when you look at integral yoga, when you look at dimensions of yoga, there are processes which help us to know how to culture the mind. And that culturing means looking within. How to bring out the best potentialities which are within. This is what is the spiritual legacy of India. And so, if we know that we have this rich thing within us, how happy we are going to be. Our dependence on the other will be less. We will not be copying something from somewhere. We will create. And if somebody disagrees with me, I would just say that today, just sit in silence for 10 minutes, keep a book and pen, and after that 10 minutes, you see how the flow will come. There will be something interesting which will happen. There are students from the design school, there are students from the psychology school, there are students from health uh, science, leadership. The dimension of the mind becomes so important at the center. And that's why the silence with which we started. Understand and recognize that silence. And that's why, as I said, that uh, I heard one uh, discussion by a Buddhist uh, uh, priest. She was delivering a lecture in Mumbai. So she gave a very interesting suggestion that instead of looking at the mobile screen, now and then, watch your mind stream at least after 20 minutes. What is happening there? Clear it if it is negative and progress ahead. Here, when you look at Sri Aurobindo's thoughts on education, and you must read it, because they try to give us a direction as to how we have to nurture our mind, how we have to develop sanctity of the senses. When we talk about senses, not to become slave of the senses, but to develop that sanctity. How to listen to good music. I always tell my students, just imagine, if the senses would be talking about oneself, about each one, what would their senses discuss about us? What would the eyes say? Oh, I am only exposed to the screen. No greenery. Or noise. No music. And so on. And that's why when you look at Sri Aurobindo's approach on the sense training which is trying to indicate, is something which is so special. When you look at India, when you look at poetry on nature, when you look at so many dimensions in Sanskrit or in our own mother tongue in different vernacular language, the colorful dimensions where the richness of the senses is seen. And that is the spirit of India. And India, not because I'm proud of India, proud of India. No, there's no pride here. There is understanding and love and compassion which is required. Experiential aspect has to become richer to understand what that India is. And when we look at this exploration of innate potentialities, it is a 24 by 7 approach. 24 by 7. And if you start exploring it, and the methodology is in Sri Aurobindo's thoughts on education, or when you look at his book on foundations of Indian culture, I recollect I took a, I was invited for a lecture uh, where I focused on Sri Aurobindo's prison experience and the suffering. And I connected it to how life perspective can be enriched when we read that book. 
I'm just trying to say this because these are deeper perspectives you get from Sri Aurobindo's thoughts. And that is where you meet that India in education. And here is the journey from information to transformation. Not just being marks oriented, but how can I receive and that receiving also should be with lot of grace. Because when I am receiving knowledge also, it is going to open the faculties in me. It is going to help me to be richer in my perspective in, in my action. And that's why when you read good books, when you read, for example, Sri Aurobindo's thoughts on different perspectives, there is something vivid. There is something rich. There is something about life you start learning and that in some way is also meditation. So not reading it just like that, but reading a page and contemplating for a while and trying to apply that in your life. And so I have done some of these things, so I'm sharing it and it's really fun. So the approach is spiritual vision about India, emphasizing the need to progress towards elevation. Today, when we look at India, we sometimes see lethargy, we sometimes see procrastination, we sometimes see a lot of negativity, we sometimes say, no, no, I can't do it. And we see there is a doubt. We get affected by failure and when we try to focus on Indian thought which has that spiritual exploration, this thought helps you to elevate which means it helps you to eliminate, remove the impurities which are within you, whether it is more of anger, laziness, doubt, uh, negativity, anything, you name it, and that can be eliminated. It is time-tested. And great thinkers like Sri Aurobindo, Swami Vivekananda have taken this forward and also added some more aspects. So we are so fortunate that we have document on everything where we need that transformation. And when we look at the crucial role of India in this process of transformation, what I like about Sri Aurobindo is he's trying to say this process of Indian nationalism. Why education is the foundation? Because if there is a change in the person, now the million dollar question, that when I talk about nationalism at the psycho-spiritual realm, we are trying to say that this is what is built up in the dimensions of the thought. So it is not just psychology. For example, if you take the first chapter, the human mind, it is not just the mind. There is a spiritual realm about it. So I start becoming aware about who I am. And the role, for example, when I go to a classroom, if I am a teacher, my entire perspective is to be a facilitator. I don't remember, and this is not an exaggeration, getting angry on my students in the class after reading Sri Aurobindo's thoughts, I developed immense love towards my students. Now this is something, and I just had started my teaching career. And this is something where I'm trying to say, this is the process and effort towards elevation. Uh, when I went to Pondicherry for my research studies, I met Professor Maheshwari, who also guided me in my work. So I was very new to teaching. So I asked him a question, a very senior scholar, at the Aurobindo Ashram, I asked him a question. Sir, who is a good teacher? Because I wanted to be a good teacher, I got into teaching. 
So he gave a very interesting answer. A good teacher is one when that good teacher doesn't go to a class for some days due to some very genuine problems. And after the teacher again goes back to the classroom after those few days. And when the students are very concerned and come to the teacher and ask, Madam, where were you? What happened to you? When that concern is there, he said, then pat on your shoulder, you are on the right track. If students are happy that you are absent, that means there is a problem. <laughs> so I try to use that as a, you know, on the path where we try to focus that when can students be happy in the classroom and when students are happy and when teachers are happy, families will be happy, community will be happy, country will be happy and the world will learn happiness as a process from all of us. And that's the reason not trying to accumulate problems but to resolve problems is also what this unlearning, the potentialities which we have. COVID has actually taught us that we have those potentialities in us where we can really address the problems and resolve. And that's the reason when we look at the rebirth of a nation, the base here is spiritual. It is ever evolving towards purity. So it is evolving towards purity and it will one day reach there. And that's why there is awakening of oneself, the oneself that is within. And that's why uh, the mother says that every day is our birthday. Every day when we start exploring something new in us and eliminating that which is not right in us, it needs a lot of introspection. And that's why I have a suggestion for my students here. Give some time for that introspection. Because the rich wealth we have today, the direction which we are receiving, we have to make the best use of it. So sit in silence for some time every day and try to evolve, try to find out what are the habits which are in me, which I have to really change. And don't start changing everything. At least first note down the good habits and how the good habits can be made best and how the bad habits slowly can be eliminated. And why is it important? It is important because you are going to be a person who will be an instrument for this transformation. You will represent your university. You will represent your country. You will represent your family and for that, that effort is required because one person who has bad habits <coughs> will disharmonize the process. And if the question is, why should I change? Let the other change. Because you are strong. Because when you change, you will feel better. And sooner you change, better will be for the nation. And that's why when we sleep also, when we wake up also, ask yourself this billion dollar question, in what way can I give back to my nation? And so, this kind of a direction we receive from Sri Aurobindo's thoughts. When we look at his thoughts, it's... Uh, not possible to cover all the dimensions here and also not all the perspectives but I am trying to connect it to the present scenario and I am trying to state that when we talk about what I am supposed to do as a person, I have to do my best. If you are a daughter or a son in a family, if you are a student, if you are connected to a community, if you are doing anything when you are working somewhere, excellence. The focus should be the fullest, the best, the purest I can give. Because while you keep doing that, you will rise. And that's why we should keep doing the excellent thing. It may be a lot of hard work. And there are two kinds of people in the world. 
there are two kinds of people in the world hard working and hardly working so the hard working will face challenges and the hardly working will always find reasons not to work so uh, when we decide to work hard we are also taking an effort to know what that work is going to be because remember whatever you do is your identity and that's why we represent the country we represent our parents we represent our uh, workplace we represent the university and this kind of belongingness is very important the minute you start belonging that togetherness is what india is all about and so we can't just be in one corner and say oh this is bad my country is like this this is bad and it's so easy to be negative but in what way i can be better in what way i can change in what way i can transform myself for that process because tomorrow you all are going to be in different careers for example sitting in this lecture you may feel tempted to talk to somebody but why should i be in silence that is also discipline that is also listening can i be a good listener when i talk i distract the speaker a and i distract that harmony which is within i mean to say we have to be so subtle and so mature as students and although i am a teacher i am also a student and that's the reason when we talk about this dimension of swadharma and awakening of the potentiality is the shakti that shakti that awakening you have to understand it and that's why when we look at sri aurobindo's thoughts this is some kind of a guidance the more deeper you read the more perspectives you will get because on every dimension there can be more of contemplation and introspection and that's why start it with yourself that what is that indianness i have to understand i have to bring in myself i have to see it in the other and how do i connect not just questioning something but trying to resolve the conflict or collectively trying to look positively at the problem and resolving it i think india needs that too so when we look at sri aurobindo's thoughts on education as foundation for indian nationalism there are five dimensions first dimension is about awareness there is a self exploration so when i start becoming aware about my own body about my mind about my understanding about my thoughts that dimension that there is something within me which is trying to provide me that type kind of a direction that is the process of self exploration today machines are distracting us now and then or sometimes we are vulnerable to those thoughts that we get distracted in the outer world if we don't get a distracted or prevent that distraction we will be in a position to focus on exploration the self exploration because there is something fantastic in each one of us so if we start looking at that within we will be directed now and then by that within at the end of my lecture i will be reading a poem which i have composed which perhaps will try to focus on this self exploration second dimension when we look at indian nationalism and uh, sri aurobindo's thoughts on education as a foundation there is an awakening the sensitivity that i become more sensitive i become i understand the other the empathy part of it 
I don't want to be in a society which is indifferent. I understand. I try to connect. You know, in India, we have it so natural. If somebody is near your house and wants to know an address, and you ask somebody, that person will even come and show. Or visiting our uh, neighbors is just so natural. We don't have to ask. There is nothing like privacy. Whether it is right or wrong, but this is how we are. That we can easily go and have communication. Now then we, there is some kind of a sensitivity. It is not just going and talking. But it is also understanding the other. It is sharing of problems and finding a solution. Because we do not want a society which is totally alienated. We want a society which is connected, where there is respect for the other, where there is a values-rich approach in not only in our research papers, but in our action. So when you are a part of this university also, this university also is a family. How to make it best when you move around? How will this become best? If, for example, after this program, everybody goes out, and somebody forgets to switch off the lights, fans. You be the first. That is sensitivity. Humko kya karne ka chalo? No. You have to, even when you're going around and if you see a light on, switch it off. Tap is running. There is something there which is lying. You can take it and put it in the dustbin. It's your university. In fact, I would suggest today, when we talk about sensitivity, when we talk about India, when we talk about understanding the other, uh, I would suggest some projects which students come up with that we want to do this to enrich our campus experience. We want to do this for our university. And I say that there should not be any formal display of uh, that, please come. Students on your own, develop a document and go. I had this kind of uh, a experience in one university where I was invited. I had appealed to teachers, the same thing. And after my talk, there were some 10 projects the teachers decided to do on campus whether it is environment, whether it is anything. I'm not trying to say, see how powerful I am. <laughs> no, not at all. I just want to say you all are very good people, rich in sensitivity, and there has to be an explicit dimension of that sensitivity. Because when people come together, ideas are there, and when there is a focus on India and the world and the peace and the future, we all have to go together. We don't wait for crisis and that crisis teaches us to come together. We have to coexist. And so, there can be an annual program where such projects can be taken up and uh, all the students who come up for teacher-student project also. And all should be appreciated and a document should be shared by the university that these were the students who did this project not for marks, not for fame, not for name, just for itself. It's, it's going to be a good feeling. Just a suggestion. When we talk about the third, aspiration and spirituality, when we talk about Sri dimension, if you asked where is this nationalism Sri reflects upon, I feel in every book, in every thought, I see this, and when you look at his life divine, the first chapter, the human aspiration, it focuses on that spirituality, it focuses on that journey, it focuses on understanding oneself. It is not so heavy as some of you may feel. And it is not that easy as some others may feel. An effort is required, and so, that aspiration, we have aspiration to go abroad, we have aspiration to become some, some that's, that's good.
बट वी हैव टू हैव एन एस्पिरेशन टू बी अ बेटर ह्यूमन बींग वी हैव टू हैव एन एस्पिरेशन टू अंडरस्टैंड वन सेल्फ एंड अंडरस्टैंड द अदर बिकॉज द कॉन्फ्लिक्ट इज आई डोंट अंडरस्टैंड माई सेल्फ एंड आई डोंट अंडरस्टैंड द अदर so when we look at this approach the sustainability aspect of it so it is more sustainable it is not sporadic it is more sustainable and this sustainability is today when we look at projects today when we have the nature person projects uh this will become more interesting or there are many things in india Uh, which need to be transformed and you will be the first to locate that and do it in your own way it can be at the digital level it can be at still different level with startups or it can be at a different level where you try to communicate and you know develop a document and when we look at the attitude the dimension of sanctity you know trying to develop that sanctity in whatever you are trying to do will also make you a better person when you are trying to do it and that's the reason when we look at this connection when we look at your windows thoughts this connection is of the body mind soul that is where the nationalism becomes more interesting we also have the connect of self and society which is unique I also see when, as a researcher and a teacher, when I look at your Bindu's thoughts from the perspective of India, it is not just for India because in depth India is the world. So India to the world, because we have that commitment. If we have understood a path which is taking us to peace, we have to help others to look at it. And so, if you look at India, we have always tried to give. when you look at this uh, philosophy of yog which has reached different countries this is the giving without any expectation it is just giving cooperation ignorance to knowledge we do not cooperate with each other we fight because there is lot of ignorance for whatever reason and so when we look at sri aurobindo's thoughts there are certain dimensions there is a wake up call for every indian and this is where your ignorance has to be removed and it has to be replaced with knowledge and contentment the world outside and the world within the world outside is very very busy world with too many opportunities but the world within is also very very important because the world outside can be beautiful if the world within is more beautiful and that's why what is that world within indian thought is about that world within and that's why we may not be a very rich country today but today we have a very rich thought and that thought is of contentment contentment does not mean being complacent contentment is where your strength towards what you want to be also becomes more focused and qualitatively better when we look at global relevance of sri aurobindo's thoughts i I have designed an academic program based on my lecture today, because I also start challenging myself that after this lecture, what is it? Just going to be a lecture? I think no. There is there are possibilities of bringing it into a more academic framework. Workshops to develop framework of public policy based on this Indian nationalism. There is a lot of scope, as I see it. there is also a lot of scope for debates and discussions and global program for global citizens so we as indians can develop global programs 
on Sri Aurobindo's thoughts on education, which focus on life skills development, values enrichment, self-exploration, and today when you look at HR, when you look at the corporate world, when we talk about profits and when we talk about competition, India can reflect on competition in itself. And when we look at Sri Aurobindo's thought, the focus is on excellence, is what, as a researcher, when I try to see more and more potential, there's no competition with the other. There is competition within, that is, you have to move towards excellence. For example, today, if you were tempted to talk to your friends when I was talking, you have to ask yourself, why did I get so tempted? And I would really keep this platform open for all those who are talking. You can come and share your thoughts. But let me tell you, as I said, each one of you represents your university. I will go today, but I will carry an impression about the university. So this is also very important, that we are so matured that we have to present ourselves as mature being. For a teacher, whether somebody talks or doesn't talk, lecture should go on. But standing here, delivering a lecture, and somebody talks, there is a distraction which happens for many hours of study which is involved in this presentation. It is also sadhana. I am into teaching for the last 30 years. I'm telling you this because some of you will be teachers, some of you will be standing here, some of you will be making presentations in the companies, some of you will go global, you will represent your India, you will represent your university, and these small temptations, try to eliminate, try to be a good listener, try to understand what the other is saying, and if you don't, try to seek help. It is not about who should change and why. It is about change is necessary because in a group of that India, you should not misfit. So the conclusion is, the need of the hour is to explore India within and in the external world. And so we have to constantly do it with oneself and role of India in nurturing global peace. This is significant because the minute we start understanding our role, many peace programs can be developed in India. And so let me once again thank the organizers, Rishigod University, I'm very fortunate I got this opportunity to share my thoughts. I'm very grateful to all my students who are here that I try to share something. Uh, I know at a point it must have been a little abstract, but as we start growing higher, we have to also look at the abstract because from there the journey will start. Everything in life should not be simple. We have to challenge ourselves to be better and still better. So, I'm going to share and conclude my session today uh, with a poem. And uh, this poem is symbolic, maybe, of whatever I have tried to say. And uh, maybe you will connect with it. This poem is dedicated to Sri Aurobindo. The title of the poem is Journey. Journey. Deep within is that another world. Deep within is that another world. It is most often, it is most often unheard. Deep within is that another world. In it, in it stays the peace bird. Deep within 
is that another world, it has memories. It has memories of the bygone observed. Deep within is that another world, from it emerges, from it emerges the final world. Deep within is that another world, it reaffirms, it reaffirms, pen is always mightier than sword. Deep within is that another world, explore deep within that another world. Thank you very much. Ma'am, and uh, I would like to ask the audience if they have any questions, they may go ahead, please. Council of Philosophical Research for sponsoring uh, uh, this lecture series and uh, as we celebrate 150 years of Sri Aurobindo's birth and 75, uh, 75 years of India's independence, uh, celebrating the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahatsa. Then uh, I would like to thank uh, our director Sampadanand Mishraji for coming up with the idea of this lecture series, our Vice Chancellor Shobhit Mathurji for always supporting us, members of our faculty, staff, 
and uh, our students for coming to attend this lecture. And uh, last but not the least, our technical team, Saurav, Ajay Bhaiya, and everyone, Manjit Ji, for uh, you know supporting us and making everything happen. So thank you so much. And uh, now we will like to close this session uh, with Dharana by observing a minute of silence. 